When estimating a population mean, there are generally two cases. In the first case, sigma, the population standard deviation, is unknown. So we're estimating the mean, and it would make sense that we probably don't know the population standard deviation either. In case two, sigma, the population standard deviation, is known. So of the two, the first case is much more common that we wouldn't, if we don't know mu, the population mean, we probably don't know sigma, the population standard deviation. So we'll start with the more common case, the first case. So here's our notation for the first case. Okay, so clearly we'll be talking about that population mean, mu. So that's our population mean. This is what we're trying to estimate. And then x bar is our sample mean. And recall that x bar is the best point estimate for the population mean. But as we've said, we'd rather be more accurate than just having one number to represent the population mean. So we're going to learn how to construct a confidence interval, an interval of values to estimate the population mean. Then we have s, which is the sample standard deviation. Now we said sigma is unknown. That's the population standard deviation. But assuming we have a sample, we can compute x bar. We can compute s, so we would have it. n, of course, is our sample size. e, capital E, is our margin of error. And we'll see how that's made up, what numbers go into calculating that. And finally, we need to calculate this margin of error when we do not have sigma, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but we use the student t distribution. So our critical value, rather than being a z value, is a t value, t subscript alpha over 2. This is our critical value. So this is the notation we need to understand for computing and calculating a confidence interval estimate of the population mean when we do not know sigma, which is the much more common uh, situation. So the requirements for doing this, and we've discussed this before, but quickly, that we have a simple random sample, and either or both of these conditions are satisfied. We start with a normally distributed population, or the sample size is greater than 30, or both. That would be fine, too. So our confidence interval that we're going to construct looks like this. We use our point estimate, x bar, and we subtract from it the margin of error to get the lower confidence limit, and we add the margin of error to get the upper confidence limit. So where does E come from? Well, there's that critical value T alpha over 2, and we'll discuss that in a minute. Um, and here is our sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. So it's the product of these two things. The critical value times the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. So now let's talk a little bit more about this student T distribution. That's the full name for it, or just the T distribution. So I want to compare that to the z distribution or the normal that we've talked about before. So we see here um, the z distribution and the t. I've labeled those. Um, notice that they both come to a little peak in the middle. Of course, this, the z, the normal, as we've seen before, is a much higher peak here. But they both have a mean of 0. It doesn't matter which one you're using. Now, we know for z 
that our sigma on the standard normal, which is what the z distribution is, sigma is always equal to 1. With the t distribution, sigma varies, but it's always greater than 1. So remember, sigma, or the standard deviation, tells us something about the spread of the data. And so if the t distribution has a higher standard deviation, than the normal, then clearly the spread is greater. There are more values out in the tails than there are with the z. Thus, the tails are, are wider out here. Um, the other thing to know about the difference in these, as our sample size increases for the t distribution, as n gets larger, it tends to be more and more normal. That hump gets higher and higher until we have something that looks much more like a normal distribution with large n with when we're using the t distribution. So they have the same general symmetric bell shape. Um, the standard deviations are, uh, this is the relationship, for the normal it's 1, for the t distribution it's greater than 1, and as n increases the student t gets closer to looking like a normal distribution. Now, to calculate a t distribution, we need something called degrees of freedom. And we abbreviate that df. And to get the degrees of freedom, it's just the sample size minus 1. So every time we calculate a critical value, a t critical value, we need to know the degrees of freedom. And in fact, the t alpha over 2 is actually, we would actually label it as t alpha over 2 comma, this is all in the subscript, degrees of freedom. Because it varies, the, the critical values vary with the sample size. So there's the student t distribution is different for different sample sizes and like I said as the sample n gets larger uh, the student t looks different it gets more and more like the normal distribution so when we're going to cal calculate these critical values we need to know our degrees of freedom now we can find these critical values using tables or with technology we will be using technology, the TI-83 or 84 calculator, to find our critical values.